to national space law and regulations be harmonized to enable seamless operations in space as more countries launch their space programs? So whoever would like to take that question, thank you. I'm happy to open the remarks from the field on this question. Uh, good afternoon to everybody who's on the call. Uh, my name is Martin Farkach from Company Stratosyst. Just to introduce myself. Uh, well, this is a very, very broad question. And honestly, I would say that uh, some regulation or harmonization in this field has been overdue for a very, very long time. And I'm a bit afraid that we miss the good time when the harmonization and regulation would be easy and it will be diff very difficult to introduce nowadays when it's really very busy, very different interests in place and so many actors struggling in a very thin area of the orbits that we have at disposal and even going for beyond. So uh, I believe that the only way forward is really to kind of introduce some international organization uh, that will kind of oversee uh, these activities and oversee the harmonization to kind of set some rules together. Uh, my personal opinion is that the Outer Space Treaty um, is, of course, it has many good ideals, but it's not that useful in the current environment. And we really need to uh, see the path forward uh, because it's going to be more and more busy in this area. And we need to kind of find some rules of the road that everybody uh, in the world uh, can be able to access and access them in a manner that makes sense not only for the user, but for everybody else on the planet. Thank you, Martin. Lisa, go ahead. Thank you, Martin. And hey, everyone, it's a pleasure to be here as well. Um, so I'm Lisa Kusher, and I'm working in the space startup called Respectus when we are dealing with expert control uh, compliance and regulations and helping space companies in that area. But particularly what I would like to just add up to what Martin, you said, it, it, it it's indeed the case. So we're not um, in the level when you can draft a binding space treaty, but there are a number of mechanisms the countries agree on so far, for example, on guidelines, on sustainability guidelines, on space debris mitigation guidelines. And those can be good starting points to consider for the states as well when they will draft their national space law. So good anchor points then for all of the national um all of the national reg reg regulators to fill in these gaps. So even if we are not in the stage when we can draft a treaty, but and it's advisable, it would be very great, great to have one, but we are on a good track on finding consensus on these new emerging issues that uh, are uh, are appearing right now, especially when it comes to sustainability. So being on that uh, common ground already is a, is a great beginning to, to start in, in the future harmonizing them and compiling into something that will be binding, hopefully. <laughs> Well, thank you for starting out with such a challenging question. This is John Quinn, Exos Aerospace. Um, I think we have a great construct already in place. Um, I think we're a little bit late to the game already. Uh, industry has commercial front runners that are already out there doing some of this. And now we have to make the best of a rapidly advancing situation. Um, I think the basis has to be uh, something that's already existing, which obviously Internationally, we have agreed um, through FAA, AST, and the different regions' air traffic control how to do that. And we have zones, right? You know, we have uh, areas around our airports where we control the airspace based on pre selected criteria. So, why can't that airspace just be extended into space? Um, and we follow that same structure as a basic framework for moving on. It doesn't require a treaty, um, but I believe that that's the fastest way through to being able to start to address uh, coordination from country to country across the world. And, and then go back for the second question, which is uh, well, currently what we see right now is increasing uh, pace uh, of uh, spacecraft production and launch rates. Um, so, so more, we, we, we're just doing more, right? Which is, which is good on one spectrum. On another spectrum is uh, how can regulatory bodies ensure safety and security of these space activities while we're seeing more of, more of these activities?
Yeah, I'll start out with that. I think um, a non-regulatory approach is the easiest way to start because I would hate to see a framework built around a structure that's not workable for what industry is going to morph into, right? So from the safety aspect, um, I'd assume, you know, the air class, uh, airspace classes, as I proposed earlier, and then facilitating a file and fly structure. Now, right now, many countries across the world, for example, accept the FAA, US FAA launch license, right? However, for their particular region or where you're launching, you still have to do the safety analysis. And that given country has to accept that, yes, your safety analysis is appropriate for where you are and the insurance uh, that you would provide would be appropriate for that particular location. So again, uh, I'm much more of a build it on existing infrastructure and things that are already accepted. I would love to see all the nations across the world accept uh, other countries' launch licenses, and then, then just turn it down to, yes, we need to do the risk assessments for the particular country that we will be flying from or over. Thank you, John. If I may, I would like to follow up on John, especially on the previous question as well. Uh, I think that we can take a very good example from what is happening currently around the higher airspace. Uh, around the stratospheric platforms that are coming into the place and we are trying to create legislation and actually I would say draw a line between traditional aviation and really space traffic as such because we kind of need to define the border where really the space starts and what is the traditional aviation and actually what we are doing with other companies and with other regulators around the higher airspace is to really try to find a uh, harmonized and regular regulatory framework uh, that is driven by the needs of the industry, uh, by the, let's say, foresight of the industry, what they are working on. And it is expected mainly uh, that the industry will come up with the proposals for the regulators, how everything can work together. And actually, we found out that in many areas, we can self-separate ourselves as operators. If we talk to each other, if we have the means to communicate to each other, we are able kind of to do lots of things around the deconfliction and around the safety ourselves. Still, there will be areas where some harmonization, where some traffic management body would probably be good if they can kind of come into place and step inside and do some decisions that cannot be agreed by the actors. Uh, but still, I think that a good example can be taken from what is actually happening around the stratospheric operations. Uh, FAA is doing the e-traffic management conops, EASA together with Eurocontrol for the CESAR joint uh, undertaking. They are working on the eco conops for the higher airspace. And actually, it's not just about higher airspace, what they are doing. They're already talking about the space traffic management because in the traditional aviation and traditional airspace, they need to account everything for. They need to account for the traditional aviation for the drones, for these higher airspace operations, and also for the space launches. And they are actually already right now writing down a framework that will virtually enable the future vision of this space and airspace management, including space traffic, higher airspace traffic, and traditional aviation. So it's already started happening, but we just need to integrate it and also take the look more precisely on the space because that's been on the outskirts so far. They already they right now care only about launches and possible descents, but we need to kind of take specific steps also around the operations during the lifetime of the satellite, when the satellite ends the lifetime, if there are kind of some safe checks for the deorbiting of the satellite, like there can be lots of to, lots done around that. And I think there are many opportunities on which we can work together in the future. So Martin, Martin, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask a question with that as well. Or Lisa, do you want to add something to it? Go ahead. Uh, just to quickly on that as well. So uh, uh, if if those are regulatory bodies on the national level, this is this is the thing that they can do is to impose some of the conditions before delivering um, licenses for launches and be before authorizing their national space activities. So, for example, that was uh, that was the case with the French space law when they're saying, OK, so your uh, authorization to do a space activity can be subject to a certain conditions that you will comply with this. Uh, with, for example, the sustainability that uh, 
safety and security would be on the on the particular level that the state will decide. So this is something that can be directly integrated to to national laws, and this is what is actually happening right now. So might work on that level too. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So uh, the question here, uh, I want to ask you also, uh, Martin, that when you talk about you know uh, compliance, so maybe we can talk about how governments uh, can work together with the private industry to ensure the compliance. Uh, what what will be strategies right there in terms of the communication? Well, there is always difficult to find some common medicine that will work for everybody. Uh, what we've experienced ourselves, that it was us as industry who came to the governments and to the regulators and made the proposals. It's very hard for the government to identify the stakeholders that can come in the years in the future because they may not be on the scene and they are not seen by the government. So it's mainly on the industry to kind of step forward and say, we have these proposals, we see this as the plan, can we talk about it together? So I wouldn't say that it's the duty of the government to be the one who kind of comes out and asks. It needs to be the industry, but the government definitely needs to create the opportunity for the industry to talk to each other, to talk to the government, uh, create the body where this discussion can really start from so that we can write the harmonized framework for the future. And what challenges do you everybody see in terms of enforcing these, let's say, regulations? So once again, there, there, you, you know, there is a common ground met in terms of, let's say, the policy and and uh, how how we can ensure the compliance uh, for the companies to 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 follow the rules, um, uh, and and what could be applied there in that area, maybe. Uh, excuse me, uh, may I add something? Uh, first of all, I would like to um, mention that of the emerging uh, challenges. Uh, for um, all countries. Um, it's about uh, registration of space objects. Uh, first of all, I should note that, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, international space law um, so far has not uh, legally recognized the uh, definition of space technologies as well as the <clears throat> definition of um, space objects. However, uh, in particular countries, um, uh, developed countries such as China, uh, plenty of uh, private companies have been emerging, but uh, <clears throat> we are not um, aware of what kind of activities they do. I mean, whether they are civil activities for peaceful purposes or military activities, because as they are international registration, I mean, international registration of um, space objects which are uh, demanded um, by uh, registration convention as have not been uh, executed by particular countries uh, China uh, so uh, as well as Russia Federation I mean um, Russia Federation uh, Russian Space Agency Roscosmos they have um, started uh, not to collaborate with uh, UN institutions with Western institutions um, space issues, I mean. Uh, so it's a little bit complicated uh, topic. I mean, uh, politics, unfortunately, have intervened in uh, international law regulation, and um, but nevertheless, um, not uh, customary law norms, but soft law norms may help, um, uh, may help international space community to harmonize uh, uh, and not to, um, uh, low clashes, skirmishes uh, between uh, highly developed uh, emerging, uh, highly developed space countries and emerging space countries. Yes. Thank you, Vugar. Yeah, I might be living in a little bit of a dream world, but uh, I would love to see some commercial companies come out um, and provide, kind of do the uh, honey solution instead of the whip solution. I think we'll get a little further with that, uh, much as we did with the space station. Um, having access to the existing space debris and flight databases um, that each member nation uh, would support with data. And if we could get the collaboration, you know, there'll still be two or three across the world that could essentially do the same thing um, to facilitate such a system. You have to be a participant in good standing in order to uh, have access to that data. So 
Uh, I'm sure AI will be required to augment that data and to actually kind of fill in some of the gaps um, and make that value of that capability uh, something that everyone will want and it'll be a reward for your participation is that everybody would be able to file and fly again that uh, you know kind of early stage format and then we'll develop regulation out of that uh, convening body in a later date. And I, I'm sure I could find uh, several insurance companies uh, sure, Lloyd's would be very interested in uh, participating in a reduced rate structure uh, for companies that are part of providing the data to help us achieve safety globally. So maybe that's the candy side instead of the whip side of uh, regulation. And John, you mentioned something that uh, obviously during this convention for entire four days, we, we spoke about a lot in, in terms of uh, STM uh, common rules or, or again, space debris and sustainability. So, and, and these are not even emerging issues. These are the current issues and, and some of those also include cybersecurity. So how those are being addressed in, in the space law and regulations? Yeah, well, currently under part 450 in the US, I have to have a deorbit plan uh, in place before I launch, right? So that has to be previously approved. I'm sure uh, flyover nations and depending where you proposed to deorbit, uh, we'll have implications that reach beyond uh, our FAA launch license, specifically if it were an air launch, for example. Um, from the cybersecurity side, I think uh, that's coming to a point where it will somewhat solve itself um, through the rollout of crypto and using crypto keys and XRP and uh, different blockchain type technologies uh, that we use for security in space. And so I think that's evolving. It'll probably meet us at a pretty good time with, uh, I know in the US, the pull forward of ISO 222 for those uh, cryptocurrency standards. And again, the utility of it, not actually cryptocurrency, but the utility of self-custody keys can aid our security and be a large portion of that answer. Again, the consortium uh, model where all these nations are feeding in this data and we operate on you know one standard protocol per system again maybe you have two or three but i think as part of a space flight consortium that that model again works without such the regulatory framework again putting out there the value of the system that's created hopefully by a couple of commercial providers yeah i definitely agree john like the consortium that you talk about i think at the end, probably need something like some international space traffic organization, something like that, that really kind of create a register of the objects that are orbiting, flying around that, putting the at least the name of the country it's liable for, and so uh, like some features of the orbit or the parameters. It definitely will not state application because there will be many, although peaceful but defense satellites that they, the governments will not want to share specific data but at least kind of the trajectory of the orbit, the lifetime, the proposed lifetime of the satellite and uh, uh, state that is liable uh, should be kind of put together in the register. And if the state uh, that is liable fails to deorbit the satellite after its lifetime ended, then it should probably pay some penalty fee or something like that in the future. But definitely what you mentioned that is currently in practice in US when you kind of want to launch a satellite that you need to have some plans for deorbiting and everything like that that should be already in the statute of this organization or consortium or whatever it will be so that each state is kind of bound by this rule because we want to make it sustainable it's kind of strange to talk about sustainability in space but uh it's all around us and uh we need to kind of tackle it sooner than it becomes a bigger problem than it's already has been uh so uh, we really need to kind of start thinking about it in these terms of sustainability and if somebody fails to do it they need to kind of pay for repairing the damage they've created and i believe that in the future we really will really have the technologies to kind of clean the orbits kind of clean the space debris but it will cost money so if you fail to do so you need to at least provide a budget for cleaning the orbit for the mess kind of you left there if you are not able to clean it just bring my points to that yeah great points martin i'll throw on to the top of that we have a potential uh, solution in place already you know, there are many people picking up space debris, but what happens when you start bringing back 
uh, mining from an asteroid that's worth a trillion dollars. You know, how much is clearing that path home worth to you? That now has a value proposition. And guess what? The insurance companies will even step in and say, you get rid of 20% of the debris and, you know, there's going to be uh, benefits for your rates because you're part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Uh, excuse me, Mr. John, uh, may I add something to your uh, really? conversation? <laughs> at, uh, as Ms., uh, um, at, as uh, Mr. Martin uh, mentioned about um, uh, space debris, uh, cleaning uh, orbit uh, after um, end of the li life period of the satellite, but uh, <clears throat> we should not forget that, unfortunately, in international and so uh, due to the orbit has not been recognized. I mean, uh, there's, uh, and um, uh, as I know, there's no any kind of technology, highly developed and uh, <clears throat> secure, safe technology, which may clean orbi um, orbital position uh, when uh, a satellite um, ends, because uh, despite that this satellite is not utilized technically, nevertheless, it poses a danger, a threat to um, you know, nearby satellites in the orbital position. Um, so um, recognition, um, recognition of um, private space actors uh, should be established uh, in international space law uh, in order to uh, compel them uh, to engage, to do some, um, in order to not to cause state liability at all, but uh, to recognize their corporate social responsibility indeed. I mean, their responsibility uh, before humanity, before the international space community, uh, um, a huge communication set out of operate, um, which have been emerging and highly developed, who uh, they have uh, lots of um, technologies uh, which um, may uh, help um, also emerging countries. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, to collaborate. I mean, um, private companies uh, in uh, highly developed countries should uh, collaborate with emerging countries uh, in order to clean orbit. Um, and but um, accessibility to technologies. Uh, so, uh, at stake, it's so a challenging issue for um, emerging countries because, uh, for example, Cosmos, Azerbaijan Space Agency, uh, is does not have um, plenty of uh, resources, uh, technologies, uh, such as, um, uh, let's say, SpaceX, I don't know, um, as a, as a, as a um, type of um, uh, huge telecommunication satellite operator. Uh, you know, to you know, to clean uh, orbital space, but nevertheless, um, there is a threat to other cosmos uh, by nearby satellite operators, especially uh, military satellite operators. Um, but there is no uh, collaboration. Uh, I mean, lack of collaboration, lack of dispute settlement, and uh, lack of proper resistance uh, emerging um, and actual uh, um, threats. Uh, for um, emerging and um, for, for uh, developing uh, space uh, operators. So, Lisa, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. To to quickly add on that is hence the importance of having a body or an organization who will overview uh, all of all of the processes that are happening uh, in there. Because so now, what do we have? We have a really fragmented uh, initiatives. Uh, in the US, it is happening in a great level as well. In the EU, there was an initiative to do a um, STT service provision portal where all of the information is shared among the EU members, but not on the international level. So it will be great to establish one first to know um, what is the risk uh, to disseminate this risk awareness among new actors that will enter the field. And second is to have joint understanding of risk tolerability uh, among all of the all of the space operators that will be there. So there is a great um, importance attached to this creation of a new body and registration is actually one of the one of the important uh, factors to this as well as you mentioned and the presence of the satellites that uh, are, are not that easily trackable uh, even within this uh, this framework. So challenges are there, but it will be ideal if we have if we have a a body like, for example, ITU, something similar to this that will just take care of uh, these issues. So, yeah, I wonder if, go ahead, John. I wonder if I could throw a question out and if we could 
come to consensus just as this group that um, the regulation will come, but initially isn't an insurance company. I mean, Lloyd's of London does the world, right? They segregate their risk. We really need them in on this conversation, but could we agree that um, a insurance agency could incentivize this whole group? I know for me, I'd be glad to contribute 10% of our policy that goes to that cleanup of that debris and reducing that risk. They're international already. They already work this problem every single day. If we could get them at the core of this and having a seat at the table, would everyone else agree that that'd be a good start to get into this? Because regulation we know is going to take years. We need to address it now. And I think insurance is the way to do that. Thoughts? Love to hear uh, everyone's comments. Well, I would say that the insurance company may have different interests than like kind of all the operators around it, although they have, of course, some common interests kind of to kind of make it so safe so that they do not have to pay out the money that kind of they signed up for. So there is definitely some common ground, but still, I'm not sure if they should be at the call, but definitely agree that they should be in the group then and they should help us to kind of kick off the discussion, kick off some implementation. But when we talk about the safety in general around that, I, as I'm a bit more coming from aviation as well, like with the stratospheric platforms, with the pseudo satellites, we are a bit on the both sides, kind of working as a satellite, but still working within the aviation. So I am more in these interfaces currently, as I'm also working on the certification standards creation. And uh, I see still many uh, things in aviation that we could kind of take example from. For example, if you want to be on the orbit for some time, you will have the orbit booked only for some time, like you have with the, with the airports and with the flights. Like you have planned for five years, you as uh, uh, liners can really book uh, the flights that you want for a specific period. And then you do not block the whole lifetime of the orbit for this one campaign, for this one country. And if in five years, new entrants come, then we have another look at the orbits, kind of have a new distribution of the orbits as per the demand, as per the new situation that we really have also the new entrants, the new countries, uh, new companies that are going to come up so that we are really not stuck with the current situation because it's going to evolve, it's going to change. Even the international framework is going to change. So we need to have something flexible. So if we create through this consortium, through this international organization, some flexible framework where you can book the orbits for several years, and then there is a new round down with some uh, whatever procurement process for each orbit or something like that could be interesting way forward. And I think that even these things we can start doing really on some common ground basis. And if I would say more than 60% actors agree on being registered, being tracked and talking to each other, they would actually push the others with themselves because uh, it would be a safety threat for everybody if they do not comply with the rules. Everybody wants to protect their assets on the orbit and everybody should have the interest of being collaborative. If you are not, you're then endangering yourself, you're endangering the others. And that should actually put everybody into the loop, being collaborative, working together, there is actually no reason why they shouldn't want to be. And if they kind of work against it, it would actually turn against them, everybody else who's in the orbit, because they would violate the basic rules of safety and of propriety and everything. Okay, so, well, me as I'm an observer, uh, it seems like we, we're trying to achieve some sort of a equilibrium here. Uh, right. And, and speaking with that, uh, how we can see that regulatory bodies, uh, you know, balance, can, the, balance the need for safety and security also with the need for innovation and commercial growth in the space sector. So how that can be achieved. Who would like to go first? If, there, if, if, if anyone. Uh, this is yeah, a very complex question. This is <laughs> yeah. a complex question yeah. and it's difficult to kind of just even open it in a way. Uh, safety and security, like we mentioned it from very different points of view when we talked about it, we can have kind of some registries, uh, we can have uh, flexible floors for the orbit or something like that, so that you open the space for innovation and commercial growth. Um, but let's say, the first line is really talking to each other and creating some international 
safety frameworks that everybody agrees upon and some international registers where every object is identified that would actually at least open the floor for improving the current situation in this area of safety and security and keeping the window open for growth but so uh, i would say if we open this question into details which it would actually require like we would spend probably three hours on the key topics of it and i think that we have 10 minutes so i'm not sure if we really want to go into the details yeah i'm a fan of a wild west approach on this one <laughs> and i know that sounds bad but <laughs> i think it's viable industry construct where space goods that are coming back um, kind of pave the way for us. And we see who gets there first. But perhaps uh, if we bring the uh, space goods back into Australia, um, guess what? It's taxed in Australia. Or we bring it back into the US, it's taxed in the US. Um, and then oceans, of course, are kind of wide open. But if we had a framework where there's a tax benefit for the receiving nation who would kind of have an upfront uh, cost in figuring out how the framework would come together, now there's an interest and there's a reason for them to participate. Um, but yeah, it's a really, really deep question. And I totally agree with Martin that, yeah, we'd be on that one for hours. <laughs> Uh, uh, in my case, re regulatory bodies can play a crucial role in ensuring safety and security in the space sector. However, there are also need to balance this with the, the need of, for innovation and commercial growth. I think uh, regulatory bodies can encourage collaboration between industry operators and stakeholders to develop safety and security standards that are both effective and conductive to the innovation. Uh, also, regulatory bodies can adapt a flexible regulatory approach to, uh, to allow the innovation while maintaining safety and security um, proportional resp response with regulatory bodies can tailor the response to different types of risk. And also regulatory bodies can continually monitor the sector of emerging risk and adjust regularly accordingly to, to the safety and security standards. Uh, also, international cooperation can work uh, with other bodies to develop consistent safety and security standards across the different jurisdictions. Uh, by tricking the, the balance between safety and security and innovation, commercial growth regulatory bodies can create an environment that encourages the growth and development in the space sector, while also ensuring safety and security for all stakeholders. Thank you. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Um, I really have to applaud the word flexible. And I think rather than regulation, prescription, right? You know, if we could address each uh, scenario in a prescriptive basis, these are what we're seeing as a, you know, here's the remedy rather than we're trying to write law into something that's evolving so quick. So great, great summary there. Exactly. As you mentioned, yeah. we really need goal oriented. So uh, framework that's really saying these are the safety objectives and it's up to you how you fill them in, how you comply with them. That's how you work with that. Like you cannot prescribe every situation, but you just need, this is the goal for the safety and the state or everybody else needs to kind of find a way how to comply, how to put in the place, the means of compliance from aviation. So that's the way for me. Uh, there is a great example of this and, um, from, from the regulatory body's point of view and um, the safety and security, that was actually pretty recent, well, uh, relatively recent in 21 in the UK. So when they passed the space industry regulations, exactly writing down what is the standards uh, for safety and all of this now is a pretty extensive documents that their space uh, operators can use. So this is this is a great advancement. And on another side, if we are talking about standardization, there is already great initiatives on the international level on uh, standardization. So this is something that can definitely be used um, as well as the first step to agree what everyone agrees on. This is mostly obviously technical, but this is this is a great beginning for everyone to have a joint uh, understanding on and then taking taking steps uh, on their national level to see how they can improve that uh, for their their own actors. 
Uh, excuse me, guys. Uh, I would like to add something. Uh, maybe uh, some of you may agree or may disagree. Uh, as you know, that um, international space law indeed emerged from international elemental law, and uh, particularly um, space debris is uh, somehow related with in, uh, with international environmental law. Uh, and international elemental law has recognized the principle of, um, I mean, um, the phenomenon of a transpondary harm. Uh, I mean, the states should uh, uh, restrain from transpondary harm uh, in international uh, international protected areas such as uh, sea beds, um, uh, ocean bed, um, uh, marine environment. I mean, in general, uh, to, uh, for, for marine, marine environment, uh, to avoid air pollution as well. So in this case, it will be uh, a better uh, um, confirmation if uh, uh, we recognize, I mean, international law communities, uh, states, private actors should uh, focus on, uh, concentrate on um, transpondary harm. Uh, so the duty to ensure uh, prompt and adequate compensation, which is also somehow affiliated with transpondary uh, harm, uh, should, be, should, be, should be brought to a light. International uh, space documents, whether it should be in uh, LTS, I don't know, maybe in, uh, in the updated form of outer space data, it should be brought uh, into attention, uh, into light. Um, and it will be, uh, and in my point of view, uh, uh, recognition of the uh, duty to ensure prompt and adequate compensation uh, should be uh, one uh, key stakeholder, key columns of um, uh, protection of safety and security, um, uh, which regulatory bodies uh, may uh, adhere uh, to us. I mean, to international space community. Yes, that's Thank you, Bogar, once again. And before we close uh, here today's session, obviously going kind of deeper into space and we, you know, now seeing unlocking, uh, you know, the next frontiers, which is going to be lunar mining or space tourism. So how can space law and regulations adapt to these new space activities as well? Uh, what would be your comment? If I may open the floor on this, uh, two years ago, I joined uh, JARUS. I'm sure if you know, it's Joint Authorities on Regulation of Unmanned Systems. It's been created some 17 years ago, but the drones as unmanned systems were kind of starting to emerge and uh, the states have to find out some standardizations across the world so that they wouldn't harm the aviation and would be same everywhere. And actually, they just put together the experts from aviation authorities and from the industry, and they started writing together the standards and rules of the road together. It was not binding, they are just kind of group of experts, and they propose these rules they, they come up with to the national authorities, be it FAA, be it EASA. And it's been working ever since because the technology evolves ever on, and actually the hubs are now part of it as well. Um, and so... Uh, Actually, I see a good example in this, that actually if we put together the experts from the space agencies across the world, people that are the industry together, and they were always happy to kind of include industry in that. And they write the rules together, and they just put them as a harmonized kind of group of people, really on expert level, without any, let's say, political background to that, really just to the practical side of the things. And they put it out, already harmonized pre -work. That's a very good way forward, and it's been working for the drones, for the unmanned systems as such. So I would see this as a road forward, what we could take, create something similar, or even kind of include it into some of the bodies that already exist. Because even though the current political situation is difficult, Jairus still works in the way that there are Russia, there is China, there is US, Australia, African countries. Everybody's still talking together, and there are no issues, and they are really working practical, technical things, and nothing has changed really. So I think we can get, take good examples from things that are already happening and just uh, take them over to the space industry. To continue on this, Martin, with regard to space resources, this is exactly what, what was the development in the international space law. And uh, so first we had the uh, the Hague uh, working group proposing a really nice uh, building blocks uh, with regard to space resources and recently we also had a, a similar body working group within the UN so this was exactly it is the, exactly what you described in in your situation when it just a lot of um, 
experts of the in in the area are sitting together and discussing um, all of these important things. And this is this is a great um, great thing that is happening. So hopefully we will also have the similar the similar discussion when it will come to space tourism. That uh, I don't know if there is a particular working group. I would assume there is for sure. But uh, with space resources, it's working pretty well, um, and there is some significant progress already. <laughs>